Hello, good afternoon, or maybe I should say good morning to you or good evening if you're watching from one of the 23 nations that are linked in into this webinar from all over the world in different time zones. As a matter of fact, we had some guests out of Australia, but they found out that actually the webinar was broadcasted in the middle of the night, so they will do with the recorded version. My name is Willem Bermagne. I am responsible for strategic communication at Forbo Flooring Systems, and I'm also one of the ambassadors of our sustainability strategy. Today, we will be hosting a webinar that looks at the future of CO2 neutral buildings. It's part of our Marmolium Live Forward campaign, and we hope that we will interest you in the next hour and one quarter in a dialogue that I'm going to have with Christina Gamboa and Dan Rosegaarde, who I will introduce in a few seconds. But first, you might ask yourself, why should, a building why should a flooring company be interested in a sustainable CO2 neutral future? Forbo Flooring Systems is a flooring company, manufacturing resilient and textile floors, just like many others. There's one difference. Forbo has been producing floors for over 120 years. As a matter of fact, Forbo's enterprise started with a bunch of flowers. Flex, the flex plant that delivers linseed from which we press linseed oil, out of which we make linoleum. Linoleum? Linoleum is a floor that you know. It's part of every school building, every hospital, every office, even your mother's or grandmother's kitchen. Linoleum is the stuff that is marbled and beige and gray. As a matter of fact, the world of, the world of linoleum is very different today. It's a versatile floor covering. It comes in over 300 colors. It comes in tiles and planks and sheet formats, but people do not really understand or know what it actually is. Like I said, it's a pure, natural product, bio-based, made from linseed, made from rosin, made from wood flour, chalk, pressed on a jute mesh. It creates a long-lasting floor covering that is biodegradable and can be used for years and years and years. The last three, four, five years, we've been talking about marmolium in a different context, looking at climate change, looking at the important factors of this world, looking at a CO2 neutral environment. We find when looking at marmolium see that, that that product, marmolium, actually is a CO2 neutral product looking at the cradle to gate stages. The plants and crops take up so much CO2 that during their production stages, which we do in a modern and very um, efficient factory, that the result equals out into a CO2 neutral product. Actually, we gain about four grams of every square meter of marmolium in CO2. That for us is a reason to look into the building and construction industry and to see whether there are more products that can reach this status. Is floor covering important? I think it is. Just remember the morning, this morning when you got up, when you went into the bathroom, the kitchen, when you brought your kids to school, when you went to your office, and if COVID allows, when you can go out sporting, when you can go to a restaurant, a cinema, there's flooring at your feet. Flooring is an omnipresent finishing product. I'll be talking to two people. They are Christina Gamboa, who is the CEO, CEO of the World Green Building Council. The World Green Building Council is a NGO which is probably the most influential in, sustainable, in the sustainable building environment. The, the uh, World Green Build, Building Council governs some 70 national green building councils that all strive within their own network to advance a sustainable built environment. Then there is Dan Rosegaarde. When I asked how I should introduce him, he said, well, you can make something up. Well, to me, Dan is something of a wizard. Actually, he is an artist, he is a designer, he is an innovator, and he has a, and he has a background in architecture. Dan creates the outdoor space, which can be transferred into the indoor space. What you see on this image 
is a smog vacuum cleaner. We come to talk about it, but I think the dialogue between Christina on the one side and Dan on the other will be an interesting mix of established good governance and innovative character to look into the future. I'm now wanting to connect to Christina, who is joining us from London. And there is Christina. Hi, you look very well. Christina, Thank you. Welcome. Um, given the fact that you just had a very tiring week all over the world with your Green Building Council annual event, how did it go? Oh, it was amazing, Willem. We had 300 events hosted in over 40 countries advocating for net zero carbon building. It was amazing, so inspiring. I learned that in, in Holland you even managed to have Franz Timmerman, the Vice President of the European Union and uh, the big man uh, behind the Green Deal. As a, as a speaker? Did exactly. It was amazing what the Dutch TPC do. They're amazing. I also joined their TV show. <laughs> and um, yes, basically, there's so much opportunity in, in Europe in particular around advocating for better policy to increase the possibilities of this movement. But I guess I'll get to that later. Yes. The way, the way we would like to start the webinar is that there's something that we discussed with both you and Dan, that you both have a presentation, and after which there will be a dialogue between us, between the three of us, and there will be uh, possibilities for the audience to, uh, to pose questions, which I will put to you. I understand that you will start with a video and then your presentation and end with a video. It will take about 10 to 15 minutes, and I leave the floor to you, and the technical detail is going to be arranged for me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, so we'll start with the first video. We are in a climate emergency. The IPCC special report warns that all sectors must eliminate their reliance on fossil fuels in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The building and construction sector has a vital role to play as it's responsible for 39% of global carbon emissions. The majority of these emissions occur when a building is in operation, from energy used to heat, cool and power them, but a significant amount also comes from embodied carbon, emissions as a result of material manufacturing and construction processes, building maintenance and renovation, and when buildings are demolished. In the next 30 years, global building stock is expected to almost double, so we must act now to reduce upfront carbon, the emissions generated before new buildings are used. Our vision is for all buildings and infrastructure to be net zero emissions across their entire life cycle by 2050. This means that by 2030, along with zero operating emissions, new buildings and infrastructure must have at least 40% less embodied carbon with significant upfront carbon reduction. And by 2050, new buildings and infrastructure must have 100% net zero embodied carbon. Achieving this vision will require global collaboration across sectors and leadership on the following actions. Roadmaps to educate, communicate and innovate towards decarbonisation solutions. Ambitious public procurement policies and embodied carbon reduction targets from governments and cities. Innovative financial products and services to trigger market demand. Clean and lean construction processes. Products produced by renewable energy. Designers specifying low carbon products and design solutions buildings designed to maximize reuse, refurbishment and deconstruction. The market transformation needed requires a radical change in the way we design, build, operate and deconstruct our buildings to conserve the world's precious resources. To find out more and how you can take action, visit our website. So, with that introduction, what I want to invite the audience is to think about whole life. For many years in the built environment, we have neglected thinking about how our decisions today affect others in the value chain or through the legacy we, we leave behind through cities and buildings. And as we realize that whole life and embodied carbon is a big part of the conversation, I wanted to start there to start to sensitize the audience on what I am aiming for. 
because the movement and, and what world, the World Green Building Council is about it has also an evolution. In the past, I guess, sustainability was pretty much about doing a little bit less harm, right? Improving it, how the built environment can address the big environmental impacts it has. In terms of carbon, as you saw in the video, it, buildings alone are responsible for 39% of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the time to act is to evolve the thinking about how to, instead of doing a little bit less harm, how can we give back and have a regenerative outlook in what we can do uh, for our cities, for people, and to ensure the health and well being of all. So, as the movement evolves from, let's say, a sustainability concept of reducing impact. We are thinking, what if we went around and say, why, why don't we reduce the whole life impact? And so we have a new strategy that we approved in last December after a consultation with many stakeholders around the world around this holistic uh, sustainability. So it's, it's, it's about, of course, sustainable buildings, uh, but that are good for the planet and don't cost us the earth. And of course, uh, the moment we live and what the climate science is demanding from us is that we act on carbon. And so that is why uh, the idea of sustainability now it's very much linked to uh, the success we can have in net zero carbon buildings. And uh, around that, as you saw, we have this campaign advancing net zero where aligned with the IPCC report of the 1.5 degree scenario, we are aiming to have a 100% decarbonized built environment by 2050. And as you saw, that means acting in, in, on the upfront emissions too by 2030, at least reducing it by 40%. And so what we're doing is increasing awareness and education on the urgency and achievability of net zero carbon buildings. And through the 70 Green Building Councils that we have around the world, we are aligning uh, on the commonality and approaches, uh, as you know, uh, all cities are different around the world and there's a sense of place, there's different cultures, but the net zero goal is, is one and the same. And to expedite that uptake is what we are about. Around the world, we have a, at least new standards now available in order to achieve those goals. And so everyone can contribute engaging in this, let's say this new wave of sustainability and net zero carbon buildings understanding that there is a benefit on achieving better performing buildings. So when I was saying whole life cycle is caring about the operational carbon. And when I'm saying upfront emissions is caring about whatever we're specifying into the buildings and having transparency on the carbon that is already emitted when we are putting up a new project or retrofitting an old one. So net zero buildings are a solution to the, to the risks we face in terms of unprecedented growth in cities. They're also a solution to driving forward the clean energy transition. They're also a solution for uh, reducing the demand on natural resources. And of course, we know that the built environment, if it's bad quality, has an impact on our livelihoods. And so the moment where we stand and the reference that it was made around Franz Timmerman and the EU Commission taking action is because policy is following up this leadership from the private sector because what we need is those performance-based solutions and that whole life vision. So it will have implications on all of you, on all of what you're doing around uh, your di different uh, professions and disciplines in the built environment, because it, it's gonna mean that the supply chain will have to think about the way you are, uh, let's say specifying buildings for performance, thinking about carbon, having a carbon calculator, if you like, and also being mindful of the materials you're specifying in the projects is pretty much around what it needs to be revisited. Around the world, this project has 110 signatories. So there is corporate commitment to this vision of net zero carbon buildings. And of course, followed also by action from, as you saw, from tools and, and education resources available through our Green Building Council network. And of course, uh, there is ways uh, to ad address, let's say, how to get to net zero. We have a net zero carbon buildings commitment. And with that commitment, we also have 28 cities and six states and regions that are sh showing the way in terms of a strong policy signal to follow this corporate leadership. 
As, we, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, we just celebrated World Green Building Week and we were campaigning for acting on climate and we had a, a lot of events that made, uh, again, us very optimistic of the vision of the possible. So what should you be thinking to achieve a net zero carbon building? I would flag these, these key topics. One is taking an intelligent approach to energy. And I mean this, uh, you can minimize energy use around all the stages of the building life cycle, including, of course, and foremost, great passive design measures, optimizing on-site renewables, low carbon technologies, and of course, maximizing the reuse and renovation of existing buildings to make them as com comfortable and less expensive to run and helping building users, of course, learn to be more efficient too. Safeguarding water resources, exploring ways to improve drink and wastewater efficiency and management, harvesting rainwater for safe indoor use in innovative ways, and in general, minimizing the use of water in buildings, which is gonna help us also save energy too. Minimizing waste and maximizing reuse. The circular economy is demanding that we also, uh, let's say, have an account of what's not gonna happen in, in the space when we deconstruct, how can we maximize the waste recovery and reuse? And what I am talking about creating resilient and flexible structures, what I'm saying is that we need to adapt to a changing climate. Beyond acting on climate resiliency to events such as flooding and other natural disasters will help people stand the test of time. And of course, those assets uh, that are the buildings. So designing flexible and dynamic spaces, anticipating changes of the, cha of the, of the spaces, how they're gonna be used in time will help us uh, rebuild or renovate buildings uh, with, uh, with much more of a success uh, possibility going forward. And of course, considering all the stages of the life cycle, going back to the introductory video. So as I said, we should be aiming to seek to eliminate all the environmental impact and maximize social and economic value over the building's whole life cycle to extend its use, useful life and evaluate the impact of all design decisions on carbon budgets, not just financial ones. Here we have uh, the risk of inaction, <laughs> the ROI. And so there's a bill, there's a movement here understanding that uh, the financial considerations have to go into a bigger ecosystem of, of uh, considerations for us to contribute to achieve a healthy, equitable, and net zero carbon buildings uh, environment. I was asked to reflect, is, it, is money an obstacle on changing the construction chain? I would say that the business case for green buildings or sustainable buildings has been proven over and over again in the last decade at least. And the net zero carbon buildings a, a business case is already proven and there's great studies from Canada, from the, from the UK that are actually saying you can a, deliver on this. And as I said, there's, there's beyond the urgency to act there, is, there are benefits, of course, in reducing the energy waste. We're advocating for net zero because buildings are leaky in terms of energy and not, and they can be cost effective if we retrofit them to net zero standards. And uh, the, we can look at this on, we can act uh, for the benefit of the society and the risk of inaction will outweigh, let's say those initial hurdles of learning how to deliver net zero carbon buildings at scale. And finally, uh, I would say the building and construction industry has a big challenge in terms of innovation and productivity. It's one of the industries that worldwide hasn't innovated that much. And we see a lot of conservative actors in the value chain. And what I'm, it's really, I'm really happy to be here today with Dan because he's a lot about all about disruption and innovation and really understanding that if you think differently and out of the box and aim high, you can do better. And so uh, with that, uh, I, will, I will pass it over to Dan. We cannot build a world that destroys our world. We need to radically change how we construct and use new homes, offices, and infrastructure so they operate at net zero emissions by 2030 while the materials used to build them are net zero by 2050. We are making progress. Construction and real estate companies are setting bold targets, 
Businesses are committing to net zero carbon buildings. Companies are innovating to cut emissions from the production of cement, steel, and glass. To accelerate the decarbonization of buildings, cities like Los Angeles, Copenhagen, and Medellin are leading the way towards a healthier and more sustainable future. The transition has begun, but we need to move faster and smarter than ever before. Humanity has no second home. It's time to build a better future, not tomorrow, today. Christina, it's Willem, just for um, a few minutes, I just want to ask you one question. Um, videos like this are very poetic and very beautiful and it makes you feel good and makes you believe that this is really happening. Um, you're aiming for a carbon zero future in 2050, which is good because you're beating China by 10 years. They go for 2060. But if I look at a company like Google, they already claim today that they are carbon neutral. But I haven't seen a solar laptop or a solar mobile phone or a Apple phone that I can take apart and exchange the batteries and the camera and stuff like that. How, how come that companies like that can make the claim with what they are doing, which to me seems like they have been doing forever? Well, I think the urgency today to call on, net, on advancing net zero carbon goals faster than what the end goal of the climate science is what makes sense. Because it's by 2050 is the latest we have to act. Mm -hmm. And so all of those commitments and, and actually on the road to COP26, which is this climate conference uh, happening next year, we're already seeing countries like China committing to some end goal. And that commitment from China will mean that we have a chance to at least reduce by 0 0.25 degrees uh, the, the global warming. So we're already uh, way ahead, if that makes sense. Why don't we see more of that and more innovation? Well, basically because policy is not aligned with the clean energy transition yet, but we're seeing a move in the EU commission and we're seeing a move in other regulations to stepping up that, that, that transfer of how do we clean up our grids? How do we power our buildings better? And why not dream big? In, in, in terms of saying, why don't we have buildings be a fleet of energy producers that they have more energy uh, to share than what they use. And then we're also innovating in the grids and in finding new ways to power the world without uh, costing us uh, our resources. So I think there's a lag in policy that is following, uh, that, is, that is called up now to follow up with the private sector, taking this leap forward in, in doing what is right in terms of also creating green jobs and opportunity going forward. Okay, but what I was actually looking for was uh, something about carbon offsets because a lot of companies today are using carbon offsets to create their sustainable image. How do you look at that as part of the transition into a net zero future? I don't see it, let's say case by case, there are science-based targets, there are very serious commitments like the net zero carbon buildings commitment where offsets are a last resort. Because while we're in the transition, there must be an opportunity for companies to deliver over the line to be carbon neutral. So as long as there is transparency and disclosure that they're going full in to what's in their power of control and with the technology that is existing today, offsets, let's say are okay and that we need them for companies to continue to invest. We, we, we need that flexibility. Okay, good. Thank you very much for now. I would like to move to Daan Rozegaarde who is joining us from Rotterdam. Daan, are you there? Yes, there you are in your beautiful studio. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, hey, good, welcome. Good, 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 good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yeah, hi. Very good. Hey, Dan, um, I was looking for something that we both have in common in one way. Okay, sounds uh, good. If you look at floor covering, a lot of people think that we are making floor covering for new buildings. There's a new building, the floor needs to go in, and here we come. As a matter of fact, 
more than 75, 80% of our business is in renovation. In other words, putting in a floor in a building that's already there that can be re reused for another 20, 30, 40 years. And after that, we come in again with our floor covering. When I saw your project for the Afsluitdijk, which is a big water dike in the north of Holland, 32 kilometers long, and you were asked by the government to make a monument, you actually said, the monument is already there. <laughs> and you went to a DIY, I don't think you went to a DIY, but you had this great idea of using reflecting tape and illuminating the lock system of the Afsluitdijk. We have two big locks and you created a fantastic work of art which was already there and now for everyone to see. That I think is the power of you as an innovator, as a designer, as an artist, as a wizard, like I said. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation towards looking towards a uh, carbon neutral future. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, again, uh, thank you. Uh, it's indeed really interesting to think about how we can enhance or upgrade or somehow make more new connections with the world around us. And I, I think we live in an incredibly fascinating world where there's maybe not just a lack of, of, of money or technology, and Christina just mentioned already uh, some obstacles, but what I miss the most in the world of today is maybe the curiosity towards our future. Okay? So we're scared, we're angry, we're hesitant, but most of the time we're not curious. And that's a big problem because if we cannot imagine it, if we're not wondering, if we're not questioning, we cannot construct, we cannot engineer, we not, cannot make it happen. So I wanna share you my screen and, and hopefully in the coming 10 minutes, trigger a little bit of curiosity uh, uh, towards the future. Here we go. Can you um, see my screen? Okay, super, all righty. So I think it's, um, it's pretty radical that we live in a world where something physically so small as the coronavirus is having such a huge impact also on our built environment, eh? the houses we live in, the landscapes we inhabit. Um, suddenly our world is filled with, with, with barriers, with fragmentation, uh, surrounded by plastic bubbles. We're even afraid to shake each other's hands. And I think for me as, 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 as a maker, when I look at this situation, it's not just a horrible situation, but it's also bad design or more or less unconscious design. Yes, it's sort of a sum of uh, rules. Um, and what I think we should do is realize that we cannot go back. And so we have to design this new normal, this better normal. I think that's sort of what drives me and drives the studio where I'm right now in Rotterdam, the design firm that I founded 20, 10, 12 years ago, basically because I had a lot of ideas and nobody knew how to make them happen. <laughs> and so basically what we do is hey, we love science, we love technology. I'm the, I'm the son of a math teacher, but we put some smart people in a room, uh, designers, engineers, project managers, uh, manufacturers with a conscious like uh, Forbo. Uh, they, they have been in this, in this room together with me. And we ask ourselves questions and we try to give them an answer. For example, how can we make buildings which capture CO2? Okay? How can buildings sort of be more proactive uh, and give a sort of kind of performative value, which is interesting. The technology is there, why are we not integrating that? Or here, when we talk about nature, a lot of times there's no place for trees. Yes, because simply it's occupied or there's a market or stuff like that. And I was thinking, you remember these postcards that you had when, when you were a boy or girl, these sort of pop-up postcards? Could we make pop-up trees? So during the week, you have time to do activities. And in the weekend, book, you pop it up and you have a tree again. Actually, some trees are actually quite um, uh, happy with sort of uh, uh, this, this kind of dynamic. And it's a way to integrate nature um, and to make landscapes which are more adaptive uh, to the way we, we live. Or here, uh, my fascination, I'm, I'm, I'm a diver at night, in tropical Asia, 700 million year old microorganism, which are emitting light. Eh? The Dutch word is zeefonk. Um, so we started to grow, to nurture them, make the most light emitting algae in the world. And the amount of light that they generate is really amazing and, and could be used for, for navigation or potential street light. Why are we not doing that? Eh? Why, how can we use nature and natural light, not just as decoration, but as, as a sort of, uh, of activation. Or here, maybe if you look on my, my uh, video screen as well, this is really amazing. 
I think this is almost eight, nine year old. Several companies are making a solar panel. Look at this, amazing, like a flexible leaf. You know, why, why am I not seeing this everywhere? It's beautiful, you know, it's not these ugly chunks. You can integrate it, it's sort of free form. Uh, Armor Group is uh, uh, researching this, um, a German uh, French company. Really fascinating, how can we sort of embed the energy harvesting more in our daily life by making it more friendly and making it more easy to apply. But beyond that, I think it's even, even more. Our, our, the landscape we grow up in also defines us. Eh? It's not just function, it's also culture. It influences us, the way we think about ourselves and the world around us. So I'm always asking, what, what is the meaning of being together? Why are we here today? Eh? And, and what can we do now today that we cannot do uh, yesterday or the year before? Or how can I feel connected? In a way for me, sustainability is not only the fact sheet, eh, the numbers, the cradle to cradle, the circular thinking, absolutely, that's definitely part of that. But it's also to have an intrinsic feeling that you feel connected because then you're gonna take care of it. Then you're not gonna break it down in five years. And then you really start to care for it and grow and say, this, we need to do that more. That drives the project. Like here, what you see uh, in Amsterdam, Waterlicht, commissioned by the Dutch Water Council. And um, they, uh, the Dutch people know, but um, uh, a lot of foreign friends, they don't know that the Dutch Netherlands lives below sea level for a large part. So when my Chinese friends come and they see the sea and then all these dikes and they're like, you're crazy. It's super dangerous. You know, get out of there. Just move to Germany, move to the higher ground. Uh, uh, but of course we don't. Eh? And, and we stay for more than a thousand years. And so we've been using design, we've been using technology, we've been using creativity and leadership to create our own home. But sometimes even the Dutch, they, they forget. And that's why we created Waterlicht, what you see here, a combination of LEDs and lenses, which shows how high the sea level, how high the water level would be um, if we stop caring, if we take life for granted. So it shows the impact of climate change. 60,000 people here at the Museum Square in Amsterdam. We did London, Paris, Dubai, uh, Toronto, uh, many other cities. And, you know, I, I, I think people somehow don't change only because of numbers, but they need to feel it, they need to share it. And that's sort of a trigger to activate and to think, how do you want your future to look like? How can we create maybe energy harvesting houses floating on the water? You know, what can we learn from, from nature? Um, and how can we create a place of, of wonder? Yeah. Or here, and you mentioned in the introduction, this is the famous Afsluitdijk, 32 kilometer, built by hand in 1932, basically to, to, to make sure we as the Dutch don't die. Uh, so on the left, you have the sea, and on the right, you have Amsterdam, Rotterdam, where I am right now. So what is really important to know is that we, we learn from nature, but we also fight with nature every, every day. Um, Part of the renovation of this famous dike were these historical floodgates. And after, you know, 82, 85 years, they were in need for some love eh? <laughs> and some, some extra care. And the concrete was, was built by hand at that time. So it, if it was rotten, it needed to be replaced. And indeed, at that time, the Minister of Infrastructure, Melanie Schultz, came to our studio and asked, can you somehow, as part of that renovation, that large scale renovation, it was uh, 832 million euro, can you highlight the iconic value? Eh? This is our Eiffel Tower. This is our you know, Berlin Wall. This is, this is our icon, but maybe not so many people know that yet. Um, so I love these buildings. They are designed actually by Dirk Rosenberg, the grandfather of the famous Rem Koolhaas. And I fell in love with them. They, they, they look like temples. So we got the funding to renovate them, make them look like, like true temples again. Uh, like infrastructure, the water management. So they, 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 re they rise and lower the, the walls of the water to keep us safe. Without them, we, we would drown. But we also wanted to make something about future and energy, but knew that any kind of technology like LEDs, drivers, microchips, sensor, would just break down and die a horrible death within three years eh? because there's a lot of rain and salt water. I mean, these are harsh environments. So I was walking there and with my head of design and one evening we realized but of course, there's already light present on this famous highway, which is the light of, of the headlights yeah, of the car. Can we not use that? Yeah? Somehow we don't do anything with the lights of the car. It's sort of waste. So inspired by the wing of the butterfly, yeah, which reflects certain types of lights, 
and therefore creates a, a color which is always vivid. Yeah? This won't deteriorate. This will always be vivid. Super smart. You know why? Why don't we have fashion like that? Um, and literally mimicking the headlights of the car. Here you see our Minister of Infrastructure. This is how we communicate with our partners, our clients, our, our, our commissioners, um, using the headlights of the car. Um, so this is daytime, completely renovated. The top layer is a, a micro prisma, it's a reflective material, daytime, and this is nighttime. So it is like you're sort of driving through the future, highlighting the famous blueprint eh, of, of, of the Dutch architect, but also making a statement of, of, of future, you know? How can we create energy neutral landscapes and how can we use what is already there, the headlights of the car to create light only when you're there? Right? So when there's no car, there's no light. So there's no light pollution, right? which is a big topic because there's a lot of bird migration area. It's a green nature area. So this sort of simplicity design generated some side effects like no light pollution when there's no car which really helped us to, to, to make something which in balance between people, uh, the environment and, and the, the, the animals uh, which inhabit it as much as, as we do. Or here, my, my fascination with China, I'm, I'm visiting professor in Shanghai uh, for design. I, 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 I'm, 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 you know, there's something which triggers me and it's not perfect, but it's curious. But then again, we always talk about clean air, clean water, clean energy. But somehow we live in a world where to pollute is for free. That's really weird though. <laughs> so one of the most important things we all agree on is really important. We don't know how to value it. We don't know how to price tag it. And that's part of the problem. So I looked at me in Beijing, I was there. Left is a good day, right is a bad, uh, sorry, left is a, is a bad day, heavily polluted. And right is a good day, not polluted. And I asked myself, what is the price of clean air? And how can we create clean air places? And so two days later, I got inspired by Beijing Smog and we decided to build the largest smog vacuum cleaner. You see it in the top, polluted air comes in, it gets filtered via positive ionization. It's a large volume in a safe, low energy way, running on solar panel and then releasing the clean air. So we have parks which are 20 to 70% more, uh, uh, more um, smog free than the rest of the city. So China started to call, how much, how much, of course. And it was really uh, cool to sort of team up with the government and making these local clean air parks all around the country. You know, one tower will of course never solve the problem for the whole city. And of course we need the, the, the green long-term investment that Christina already mentioned, but I don't wanna wait. And I think we should use any kind of tool and creativity um, to improve life step-by-step. This is in Poland uh, in, uh, in a park. And you see these little dogs there on the right? You see them on the photo? They look really happy, yeah? It was really interesting. At the day of the opening, tens of these little dogs were hanging out around the tower. And I asked my project manager, Nick, who you see here on the left of the image, what are these dogs doing here? It was this weird David Lynch movie I walked into, you know, this sort of secret dog meeting I wasn't invited for. And they looked really happy. And so we did some research and we found out that dogs, of course, have a very high sense of smell. Yes, they can smell what is it, 20, 30, 40 times better than us human beings. And so they were suffering from the smog really, really bad. And, and so somehow they would smell the clean air from far, far away and start to abandon their owner and hang out uh, around the tower enjoying clean air. And look at the tail. The right one tries to be happy, but it's a bit too small. But the, the left one is doing pretty well. And I, 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 I love that, you know, if, if animals can sense what is good for them, why can we not? And, and you know, we had the whole scientific report and, 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 and like all the numbers and the calculations and the professors, which says, yes, it worked. But actually this photo, the dog photo, uh, made that we got three new projects in one week. If the dogs like it, oh, then it must, you know, be true. Korea. And also we learned, this is Beijing smog. This is the stuff that we were sucking up from the urban sky. And I believe, um, and Christina mentioned it as well, at the cradle to cradle, we should live in a world where to pollute does not exist. Eh? Waste for the one uh, should be uh, food for the other. And I'm, I'm referring to, eh, to Bill McDonough, the cradle to cradle. I mean, it's been there for 10, 15, 20 years, but somehow it's not really part of our, of our way of living. Buckets of this stuff we had in our studio. And we realized one day, 42, 48% is carbon. Carbon under high pressure, you get 
diamonds. That's interesting. So we decided, and I have one here, I'll show it to you on the camera as well, to make smog-free rings from this captured smog. So by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air to the city where the tower is in. This, believe it or not, became very, very, very popular. Uh, we had wedding couples purchasing it to get married. Here you see a real wedding couple. It is New York Times validated uh, this. This is not actor where he proposes to her with the ring. And they said, we don't want a blood diamond from Africa. We want, you know, clean air is our true beauty. And, and I got this email, I think on a Tuesday at 8 a.m. And it was fascinating. I, I didn't even dare to, to, to wonder that this would happen as a designer. And so we called them and they said yes, not to me, but to each other. And, uh, and, and it's really cool. I mean, they're still married. Sometimes we check on them. They're, they're, they're still doing okay. And I think this is beautiful. So you need science, you need technology, you need fact sheet, it needs to work. But if it's disconnected from feeling, if it's different, disconnected from love, if it's disconnected from curiosity, it won't create the impact. So finding the harmony, finding the balance between those two creates, I think the world will create the world uh, we all want to have. We started to explore this is smog free Bilbert. Uh, I was professor in Monterey in Mexico at the university there, that's Udem, uh, a student project that I uh, guided uh, where they developed a sort of coating. This billboard provides 104,000 uh, clean air for 104,000 people. Whoa, you know. So, uh, all the, so what if we, you know, all the, all the interfaces, eh, if it's either a floor or a facade, could somehow be smog capturing. Guys, can you mute yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, or here, our famous Van Gogh path uh, to, uh, as a tribute, as a homage to the famous Van Gogh for his 125th year, years anniversary, phosphorant, eh, so it charges at daytime and glows at night. Um, yeah, a beautiful way of, of how energy neutral or energy harvesting and history and poetry, and this is still the most publicized bicycle path in the world. Um, collaboration with Heimans, which you see on the right, uh, and, and our studio on the left. An artist and an infrastructure company, a sort of West Side story of two gangs who don't really belong to each other, uh, but, but we share a common love, which is building and constructing this new world. They wanted to have a new market, a new niche, and I wanted to, to, to create larger projects. I don't know how to build a highway, so I want to work with the experts. And, and we did that. So combining sectors, not just technology, but combining sectors um, uh, of energy, of tourism, of making iconic is I think the way to sort of speed up this kind of uh, innovations. Dance floors here, what you see that we designed the first one in 2008 already, a floor which moves eight or nine millimeters, therefore producing 25 watts per module. And so the, 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 the floor can charge the DJ booth that you see or uh, the, uh, the lighting or sort of energy meter. So actually movement in your pedestrian, in your subway, in your home can be used to sort of power things. And that's, I think, incredibly fascinating. Okay, to wrap it up, you may watch this in your living room uh, in the morning or in the evening or record it and, and think, okay, yeah, that's all great, Mr. Rosegard, uh, but this sounds like a, like a utopia, a sort of magical wonderland, a rainbow in the sky that we will never ever reach. And, and yeah, maybe, maybe you're right, but, but maybe you're wrong. Um, and so I don't believe in a utopia, but I live in a, a protopia, a prototype. Yeah? So we don't know how that future will look like, but we do know some things. Um, we have to invest in new ideas to survive. We have to invest in new ideas to survive. And somehow we need to do it step by step, trying, learning, failing, upgrading. And I think if we combine, you know, the, the elements that everybody just mentioned, uh, we still have an incredible, uh, we have incredible new things uh, to explore. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Very interesting. I can imagine that a few people nodded their heads when, they, uh, when you showed the uh, pop-up trees. But on the other hand, that now in Europe, in Milan and in China, we're having green skyscrapers, trees on every balcony is also something not, uh, that we did not thought would ever happen, yet it's there today. Yeah, and I think, you know, in any kind of idea, like when you have a radical idea, 
and you present it to a large group of people, if everybody automatically would say, that's a really good idea, most, most likely it's not really radical. So, so you're right, you have to try, you have to test. Not every idea is a good idea. Uh, but I do think this integration of elements, yeah, either sectors or, or cultures or nature and, and the city, is definitely the way to go. So maybe, you know, it, it, it's as strong as a statement as a, as a potential project. Yeah. Can I maybe ask uh, Christina, if you look at the, the works of Dan, the things that he is doing, would that not be a, a, a nice uh, twist to the World Green Building Council to also use, to use the creativity, to use the wizardry of um, a designer, an innovator like Dan? Oh, of course. Well, the movement is made up of people like Dan because we create opportunity. <laughs> and it's... And, I agree. And, and, and it's... Uh, what we let's say from from let's say the organization I represent is a bunch of people from a very fragmented value chain that sometimes don't cannot impact the other and how Dan connects the power of innovation and looking aiming high if if he aims low and or the industry aims low we we will do more of the same <laughs> very yeah. great infrastructure we'll forget our connection to nature and we won't act to bring in better solutions to the built environment uh, that, that we have today, which is uh, polluted. Uh, climate change is gonna have more impact in many societies worldwide. So there's so much to do, there's so much potential. And so we embrace people. It's I, if you were seeing me, if you would have seen me, I was smiling so much about what you said. It. Those <laughs> disruptions, those disruptions are key to inspire people to act from wherever you stand. You all have a role to play. And this yep. is just I, a power of idea connecting with a person that can do something about it. And then that grows and there's more happening. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I agree with Christina. And I also think that you know, the moment if, if I'm disconnected eh, from the network, eh, from the suppliers, the material experts, the manufacturers. So I think actually the, the World Green Building Council, eh, and, and we have worked together uh, quite a while, but you know, there, there's the connection. Um, so, so I feel, you know, we just need to do more and there's a lot of potential in that. And to be honest, what I'm thinking is what, what, what we notice as a design studio is that there actually is a renaissance of, 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 of public space and public well-being, yeah, because the inside is considered uh, scary or not safe. Whether this is true or not, yeah, we won't talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the notion of well-being, yeah, to have places which are good for you, yeah, from a health perspective or make you feel safe, will be the thing for 2021. And so that's a design challenge, that's an industry challenge. And the moment you own that challenge, you will have a lot of space to to explore and a lot of investment to to make those uh, explorations happen. Yeah. Question for both of you, and I was thinking about it, uh, looking at the first slide that um, Dan showed. Are you both not a little bit jealous of COVID nineteen? I mean, this minute little the virus managed to get the attention of governments all over the world, and what we see all over. The is that Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson and our Prime Minister in the Netherlands, I do not think Donald Trump, but certainly his colleague in uh, Canada, they get up front and say people what to do. Don't go out at night, wear a, wear a face mask, do this, do that, work at home. Is it not one of the tasks that you have is to influence government to make a carbon zero future more noticeable? And more urgent. Maybe to ask Christina first. Dan is in the picture. Let's Christina. Okay. Yes, I know this. This disruption we've been living this year. I. It's. It's brought about for each one of us a reflection. And I think for the ones that are able to open up their heart to new possibilities, it brings on. The this this real realization that the virus is basically showing us what has been already been broken for many years already, and that it's the time to really accelerate that embracing of new ideas that drive forward really sustainable development going forward, because there's a, if I think history is gonna judge us on what we do today with this opportunity for a sustainable future. 
And I think it, what we're seeing is even amidst the virus, companies making, as you, as you said, Willem, even higher ambition commitments in the midst of a economic recession and the need, and that is calling on governments, as you are asking, on greater action in terms of giving the right signals of transformation and creation of more of a level, gra of a level ground to deliver on what we've been hearing. Not only an yeah. economic recovery, but it's a green economic recovery that we divest from fossil fuels, that we uh, invest in the innovations and in infrastructure that is sustainable, not other type of solutions, because that is, if you like, technology of the past, or that was what already was broken, if you like, that the virus is letting us see. So governments mm -hmm. are, 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 are really called on to take on the green economic re recovery path, get right their affordable housing policies worldwide. Think about performance and making the industry accountable for disclosure on the impact they have so we can better align the scarcity of resources we have and act on climate with the urgency that the climate science is demanding from us. Yeah. Dan, you yeah. already get quite a lot of projects from government. Do you see a move what? for getting a more broader interest for what it is that you do to translate it into a real economy, as I say? Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're busy, we're crazy busy, uh, because suddenly we wake up in a world where we're not just defined by our history, but we are defined by our future. And what I mean by that is that things are happening and future things that will, are happening will happen that are influencing us in a way that, that we, we, we hardly imagine. So you're mentioning COVID, but you know, we have some other global challenges which are still there. Eh? I mean, there, the sea level is still rising. Uh, uh, so so we're, this is just uh, the beginning. So we are forced to be creative again. And, and I think it, 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 it shakens up, us up. And so our, our, our fixed idea of rules, of regulation, of, of, of security um, is undermined. And so we have to question ourselves. What defines us? What makes us happy? What keeps us safe? And how can we create places where I feel connected, where, where, which are good for me? And what does that actually mean? And I think everybody in his or her own way has asked uh, his or herself this question in the last weeks and months. And so as a designer, I find that incredibly fascinating because if we're not makers of our future, we are its victims, yes? So, 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 so and all the elements uh, Christina just mentioned should, should be part of that. So there's just an incredible amount of work to, do, to be done. And yeah, people are more receptive towards that than ever, absolutely. Thanks. There was this one guy who said, Texas, Texas, Texas. Make people pay for what they do and things will happen. I move to some questions from the audience. Um, there's one question that says, well, and that's actually true. We talk about the big picture and the importance of striving for carbon neutral. But if you are an interior designer today, what can you do to contribute to this goal, Dan? Well, you do what you can do. That's, uh, that's what I'm doing. And that's what we're doing here with the team. You know, when you take the small free project, I'm not a minister of, uh, of finance. I cannot say green energy today, 20, 200 billion in green energy. I can say that, but nobody will listen. You know, <laughs> like, that's, not my, that's not my scope. So, so I ask myself, so what can I do? Okay, I can design, I can do a park. You know, that's sort of a good scale that I can, I can, I can, I can control a park. So I just start doing what I can do within my scope, you know, and that, that sounds very simple, but it's actually quite difficult to do. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't wait for somebody to ask you to do it because that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to call me and ask, can you make a smoke free tower five years ago? Forget it. You have to go do it. You, you know, it's scary. You're going to make a mistake. Um, and then once you've finally done it, everybody will say, oh, that's a good idea. Why haven't you done it before? So my answer would be uh, um, try to find relevance for yourself and for the world around you. Start doing it. Start talking about it. Start prototyping and, and, and start talking with your existing clients about it. And, and you know, the, the idea will guide you. Yeah, don't, don't, don't be scared. I think, thank you, Dan. I think, uh, Christina, that you have a few handles that you can offer people. You're also um, taking initiatives of the uh, lead building certification and the well building standard. 
in there, I think there are interesting guidelines for interior decorators and designers uh, for simply do's and don'ts. Can you give some examples or your view on this? Yes, okay. So I can point you, if you look at the Green Building Council network resources, there are standards that have been used to improve the quality of buildings and the spaces. And in terms of interior design, there are several standards out there, um, the ones you mentioned. But basically, uh, I, would, I would say, take them as an opportunity to also educate your clients on the value of the things they're advocating for. Because, and don't be prescriptive about it, be creative about it. So your end goal is, for example, what are, you, what, what are you aiming to achieve? Is it connection to biophilia? Is it a, an improvement in energy efficiency that people value water, that people have a great mm -hmm. indoor air quality environment? And then work yourself back to see which tool is best for the outcomes you're seeking. And then get creative about it because if you use integrative design, which is way back invented by Rocky Mountain Institute and there's great guidelines on how to better plan before you just uh, you go to your client with the ideas you can have a great project and it can be 50 square meters but you can revolutionize the, the way people are interacting with the space and probably change their behavior as dan is also showing with his projects of how people yeah. how he inspires people to get creative and change their behavior yeah and i and i want to quote our uh, our precious kennedy here hey we're doing it not because it's easy but because it's hard uh, <laughs> remember with the with the moon launch what was it 1972 or something uh, 71 you know it's it's uh, i'm not saying it's easy yeah. um uh, but you know what's the alternative to not do it no products that for both of you are no go areas where you say just like a gas gobbling truck you will not buy it today anymore if you have any sense in your head or looking at your wallet but uh, Looking at products like wood, concrete, glass, aluminum, plastics, to use the word, is there anything where you say these are no go materials for me because? Oh yeah, I, maybe I can I can start I can start with that. I think um, in in each essence, each material is innocent. <laughs> like a color is innocent. You cannot say oh blue is Israel or Palestinian. No, no. Each material, each color. Each thing is is innocent, and it's up to you, as as a person, as a human being, or as a designer, or as an architect, to 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 charge it with with meaning. And you can do good things and bad things. So so no, I think it, it really depends on on what you want and how you use it. Absolutely, yeah. I I have no judgment uh, in in its essence about that. Yeah, I don't know, Christina, how you are you feel yeah, about no, that? Yeah, the same. I like that. Yeah, they're innocent, but now they also have environmental product declarations. So if you're curious, you can ask for them and see what's their environmental footprint, what's their impact, and think about also embodied carbon. The first video I showed you, it ask about what's the embodied carbon of producing that material, but uh, they're innocent. Think about performance, specify the best solutions for your project. And if you go for a circular solutions and you find a way how to forever recycle and close the loops, then you, you, you're you getting to a good solution and, and you choose what's yep. best for the project for the space. And again, yeah. performance in terms of carbon and, and yeah. whatever you're seeking as your environmental goals. Yeah, but I do, I do I'm, what I'm doing, what I am fascinated in is, is, is the beauty as well that sustainability creates, you know, like, I mean, I sold my car. I'm like, why am I, you know, it's just collecting pigeon uh, shit, you know, excuse my Rotterdam's, but uh, it, 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 why, like, I don't want it anymore, you know, like I'll just do an Uber or, or you know, take the, take the tram or the bicycle. So I think it's also fascinating. It's, it's about the fact sheets and about the impact, but it's also about lifestyle, you know, something that if you buy a Hummer today, I mean, I don't think you're going to get a lot of compliments, Mickey, but 20 years ago, it was like, whoa. So I love how our sense of beauty, our sense of desire is changing. And designs by architects and designers and artists can speed up that process. Because once you tap into that, that's when it becomes really powerful. And I think for about that's also why, why you guys choose the materials. It's not just a fact sheet. It's also, you know, the feeling that it gives you, you know, and, and the sensation when, when you touch it. Yeah. When you show the flower image in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, there's one question coming out of South Africa, which is uh, pondering a little bit further on this. This is global. I mean, 
South Africa can import uh, carbon neutral products and they, they, they come from far, far away. It ha hampers the, let's say, local producing companies, which are perhaps a little bit more carbon positive, but they can learn. How do we balance this? Do you have an idea, Dan, when you do this um, with your uh, carbon vacuum cleaner? Is it produced in Holland and then shipped over the world? Or how does it work? Oh, no. I mean, uh, I mean I've mean, i I've traveled pretty extensively in, in, in the South Africa you know, area. And, and no, you definitely um, don't want to copy paste what you did in Europe. You want to copy more or copy morph. You know what I mean? Like the same but different. And then again and again and again. And, and that's about the materials, that's about, you know, the sense of beauty. Um, that's how people respond to it. You know, in China, what, for example, happened is that when we placed these towers is that people were bringing glass bottles to the tower. And I wondered, why, why are they having these, all these glass bottles? And what happened is that they would capture the clean air and then start selling it on the market. I swear to God, I, I saw it happening with my own eyes. And then the mayor was like, should we stop them? I'm like, well, yeah, uh, you know, no, it should be for free. So we got this weird debate on, should we prohibit this? Is this illegal? Should we allow it? Is it actually something, is it a compliment? So no, I, I definitely think it's the culture and the context should, should influence your design, but you're gonna, you're, that's gonna happen either way by launch and learn and just looking and adapting. And, and if you would ignore that, that would just be a shame. That you, it would be waste. Thank you. There's another question, which is maybe for uh, Christina, because I think it's very much part of the, let's say, uh, net carbon zero situation goal that we want to achieve in 2050. And that has to do with ended producer responsibility. Um, how do you look at that from the World Green Building Council? The fact that the manufacturer is responsible for his product until and beyond the end of life stages. You were cutting a little bit when you, can you repeat the question? The well, point? if you look at um, the notion that manufacturers are responsible for their product until up to the end of life stage and beyond. So the extended producer responsibility. Is that something which is taking uh, a, a foothold in your? That is very interesting. Yes, and I guess it's about the life cycle and the ownership of the asset, right? But okay. I've, there's very interesting uh, initiatives about materials passports and materials banks. And let's say now there's even the opportunity for you to disclose what you're going to design and build. What what are you specifying? So to, to have the full passport of the, of the material for the end of life planning on what you're going to do if that building gets uh, retrofitted or gets demolished. So with that, it's, it's it, more than responsibility. Of course, there's a carbon budget responsibility mm. <laughs> at the moment you manufacture, uh, but it's about the owner of the asset being intelligent on keeping track of what are the materials, what is their expected life cycle, and what are they planning to do when they are gonna retrofit the space so it doesn't go to landfill. And it again, it's it's that circular concept. And um, it's, there are databases around that, and there's, there are initiatives that go along that path. And if you're curious, we'll take you a long way and you will be feeling better about your project too. Okay, thanks. I think that, Next to the concept of sustainability and net carbon zero, to be able to reach that, to get to that goal, it also should be done in a way that it makes people feel good and feel happy. So the quality of the interior, the well-being of people, the indoor quality of buildings, it's something I think the World Clean Building Council focuses on. Can you say something about that? And I'd like yeah. to hear down on that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, of course, <laughs> I think here the topic also, and, and Dan may be more proficient in explaining what I'm going to try to say, but it's buildings are kind of, or the built environment sometimes is, is not as highly understood as uh, a space that impacts our wellness. COVID has changed it because now we're home and we're finally understanding that we need more flexible spaces. We probably are longing for a standing desk, more lighting, and then we see that our homes probably are not fit for 
uh, being there most of the time. So we have a flagship program called Better Places for People. We're going to be launching a framework on, on great principles around health and well-being to address air quality issues and, and other sorts of criteria that improve the connection of the individual to the sense of a improvement that it brings, a, that the buildings bring to us. And we are 90% indoors, it's a 90% conundrum. We still lack that connection of the individual with, the, with what the, the space delivers for that person. So through that project, we've been campaigning on bringing awareness to that. And also, for example, on indoor air quality, uh, we have a campaign called Plant the Sensor, where we have planted sensors <laughs> in like 30 countries and indoor projects, basically advocating and making people understand that buildings can also influence, a, if not rightly specified and managed, our own health. And we saw the color of that pollution from then. Thank you. In one way, Dan, is the well being of people and people feeling happy in their environment part of your daily work? Oh, that's, that's, that's you know, that wake, that's the thing that wakes me up at seven uh, o'clock in the morning every day. Uh, it's you know you don't want to decorate you want to reform and 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 well-being welzijn Dutch word is is for me yeah, that that's the thing that's what it is about and and the technology and the and the fact sheets and the sustainability and the money should sort of drive towards that you walk into a room you walk into a space you feel connected what is it what is that thing that you've seen in this millisecond I don't know but it's there you know and 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 in a way well-being and that it makes you feel good if i can say that also allows you to accept change it allows you to to accept new ideas and i think that's the beauty of design that it the, 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 yeah it, it, it opens you up and 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 it extends your inner horizon and maybe that's the only way to move forward so again there's not a lack of money or technology also but but Definitely, uh, it's important to trigger the, the curiosity and, and, and well-being that when you feel it gives something back to you, does that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And too long, we have seen buildings as the sum of walls, doors, and windows. Um, but actually, it's, it's a way more inactive skin. Yeah? Like your, 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 your floor is a skin, or, or your window is a skin, uh, or your room is a second skin. And um, so we're expecting more and more of it. And maybe that, that's a good thing. Yeah, there's one piece that you wrote, uh, Christina, which is uh, going towards a zero carbon building, which is part uh, which can be found on the uh, World Green Building website. There you talk about the concept of designing out carbon uh, embodied uh, products and processes. Um, the question that I have here, is it not also a question of designing carbon neutral materials, honest materials, like wood, like straw like mud like stuff you can find everywhere instead or, of or hennep I love, or hennep i i, oh, I love hennep or hennep. hennep i hear as well <laughs> yeah i love that why are we uh, not you doing that yeah how about designing in wood products christina oh totally and it goes to dan also that the carbon sequestration so there's many there's many things we can do to tackle let's say the the carbon that comes with products and of course the, the first one, of course, is try to see how can we prevent those, those emissions from embodied carbon and materials. Do we really need to build something new? Can we retrofit an old building, do, right? I think we're in a point in sustainability and, and such a, we're gonna be building the size of New York for every month for the next 30 years at the rate of development in Asia and everything. And we need to leapfrog and make it as carbon neutral as possible from starters. So I would say, William, it's a combination of all. It's a combination of companies aiming for, for carbon neutral products and cleaning up their grids and cleaning up their production process. So what designers want to specify has the best, let's say, uh, EPD possible. Yeah, and, and, and be more innocent uh, from starters. Second is, of course, thinking about the performance of the building and better specifying the mix of solutions and being innovative about bringing, let's say, a better products in terms of what you need for what you want to achieve and your client wants to achieve. And I guess from, from, the, other, from the other perspective would be also being creative on uh, how to 
uh, from the from 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 the point of view that you were mentioning in the other question, of course, also questioning in a let's say the the footprint of the transport footprint of many materials and going mm -hmm. more local and really understanding the sense of place, the people centric design, the culture. Do we really need to bring that product all the other way from the, the world? Is it that really needed? Can we better specify? to create that sense of place and really question the sourcing and the performance of the different combinations that yeah. you can take. Yeah, and I, exactly. And I, I think uh, a lot of times when I when I hear the conversations eh, about a CO2 uh, neutral world, I, I, a lot of times it's about doing less. Eh? We're going to do it 5% less worse. And, and we should do it 5% less worse. But, you know, that's that's like saying I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like you five percent more today if if that's how you would describe the relationship with your girlfriend or boyfriend that would be a weird relationship you know don't you agree so what i'm trying to say is is it's it, it, it's it's also about doing more and and sort of trying to find a new value the reason for example the, the van gogh path worked so well is not just because it was was light emitting and, and the energy but it's also something you can only see at night so it attracted tourism People would stay there. They would buy a coffee. They would buy dinner. They would buy a hotel room. So the, the the project sort of enhanced local tourism. So suddenly a design was about energy, about safety, about cycling, about tourism, about local economy. So it had different values in different sectors. And this kind of crossover thinking adds that value that allows you to, to get more people mobilized and allows you to actually realize those projects. Yes. So you have to design something that ticks different sectors, different boxes. Um, that that's sort of my strategy to to mm. to to progress and to do more, not just to do less. We're coming towards the end of this uh, webinar, and I have one already for both. Of, already, yes, yes, time flies. Oh, too bad, too bad. So we're we just can, getting uh, started. We can yeah, we're just, no, we can just one. keep on going. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. we can just keep on going. It's virtual. It doesn't matter for um, for both of you. Um, you both. Uh, you're both, let's say, your own right. You're inspirational, you're creative, you have a lot of power and influence. What would be the platform that you ideally would like to use, Dan, when it comes to forwarding a message on a better world, when it comes to carbon neutrality? Where would you be and what would you say? I'm asking you first. That's... Um... You know, okay, th this is going to be a weird answer, but can you handle a weird answer? I can handle weird answers. All right, cool. So, um, you know, in 2000 years ago, imagine we're architects and we're going to one of the prestigious clients in the world at that time, eh? the most rich, the most renowned, the most famous. And imagine we're architects and we're going to say, okay, dear client, eh, we worked on this for two years. We're going to make a building and it's going to be the church of all churches for the gods of all gods. It's going to be in Rome. It's going to call the Pantheon and there's going to be a hole in it. And most likely the first meeting, the client would have said, you are crazy. It's going to rain. Eh? The pigeons are going to fly in, you know, like, no, we shouldn't do that. But somehow I'm, I'm always wondering how that the, 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 the architects, the designers convinced and collaborated with the client to make it happen. And it's still there, okay? the Pantheon in Rome. And every three months I go there and the light comes in and the light changes it. And, and that's why it's still radical. They did something radical, something that in the beginning it would be like, why would you do that? And that's why it's still good. So, so what I, you know, maybe it's not just a platform, but it's more just a way of thinking that things that maybe intuitively in the beginning, you're sort of hesitant, actually you realize maybe it's, um, it's, it's your survival and it's, and it will create something which is epic. So yeah, just think about the Pantheon more and maybe that's the, that's my platform, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> you, Christina, would that be the United Nations or would it be somewhere else? Where would you stand up? No, so so you're very kind. I, I I am very mindful of where I where I sit and and on the shoulders of the people I I represent and the great stuff they do. I'm just a voice. I'm just here, a voice of of many that want to do better and and not a little bit better but full better. And I would say I would love to be in a place where I can get this message to people that 
desperately needed in terms of solutions uh, for, for improving their, their, their lifestyles. And uh, if, because, I, because I think we've, we've been seeing, let's say some, uh, probably in our top of mind, we have very high level end projects, but I, what, what's gonna be most built around the world is affordable housing. <laughs> So mm. I would be is and now I know my answer. I would try to convene the ministers of infrastructure from around the world and try to get a global covenant of ministers of infrastructure to collaborate on best practice and try to get inspired on getting better policies that go into affordable housing. Because all of what we've talked about and all those rating tools, all of those solutions should go to the, the, the lowest income of the population. And we need to leapfrog the regions of the world where they just need one, one school, one pantheon, one house, mm -hmm. one solution <laughs> to thrive in life. And so I would do that. If I could do that, I would convene the ministers and, and because it's, they, they don't connect, they don't share. We have city networks, but the ministers of infrastructure that are responsible for national visions of what is the urban environment, what could be done in affordable housing, they don't speak to each other. And so we don't have that connection of best practice. I would love to do that, even though it sounds really hard. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Sounds, uh, sounds, Christina, sounds, sounds like a plan. Modest, sounds modest, but also it is realistic. And I think it shows that big organizations like the World Green Building Council can actually achieve things by doing things step for step. And that's step by step. And that's maybe the difference between the wizard and the innovator and the NGO, which needs to deal with the reality of um, our day-to-day -day life. We'll come to the end. Oh, believe is, me, um, believe uh, me, I have to deal with the day-to-day. There was one day question saying, asking me what, how, I, I see yeah, that believe me, I, believe me, I have to deal with the day-to-day -day life as, as much as an NGO or, or you and me. So uh, like, Good. there's no difference there. Good to hear that as well. <laughs> okay. So a wizard, but feet on the ground. Yeah, I'm Good. still here, no? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sorry, um, what is... Forbo actually contributing to a CO2 neutral future? Well, we're doing numerous things. First of all, we have a sustainability strategy. A sustainability strategy that stretches until 2050, where in the end we want to become a zero waste company. They are big words, but they are just as big as, as words as saying by 2050 we will become uh, zero carbon or uh, CO2 neutral. Zero waste company by 2050, having a carbon neutral product portfolio as early as 2040, all our products, working towards it. A strategy is fine, but you need to have a program. Our program, Creating Better Environments 2025, is here to be launched this month to run, and, uh, to run us into the next five years, 2025. We will all be still there. We will all be responsible. That's the way how we look at our sustainable future. And of course, we have a right to actually say this because with the 120 years, we have brought to the market a product which is carbon neutral already today, which is sustainable, made from natural resources. And as a matter of fact, a beautiful product ready to use today, tomorrow and forever. We will finish with our Marmolium video and I would like to thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. We move. It's what we're meant to do. Caring drives us forward, challenging the status quo. We take the floor, leading us away from synthetics and bringing us back to nature. It's made from natural raw materials. This, this is a truly CO2 neutral floor without offset, made for the world we're moving in. This is the path for you to discover, to live on. Live forward.